Hi, my name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. Uh, you can check out the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations to check for new ones coming up with uh, Jack Rosnicki, Peter Hurley, Don Komarechka, John Miss Kelly, and James Hefner. Um, you can also find links to previous conversations there. My guest today is Rick Friedman. Rick has been a photojournalist for over four decades based in Boston, but he travels the world for numerous publications and corporations and advertising assignments. Um, let's see, he's photographed every president since uh, Jimmy Carter up through Donald Trump in the 2020 campaign. His political photographs have been appeared on the cover of numerous magazines and books. Rick also has been teaching his lighting and laughing location lighting workshops for the past 16 years, where he's taught thousands of people this practical style of lighting. So everyone, please welcome Rick Friedman. Hello from Boston. How is everybody this morning or afternoon if you're on my end of the uh, country? <laughs> so, uh, John, thanks so much for having me. It's sure. uh, great to be here. Hello to everybody. It's a pleasure to meet you all. What I would like to do today is uh, share a little bit of what I do uh, my, my true background is I'm a magazine photographer, but as John said, I teach a lot of workshops. Uh, I also do a lot of travel photography. As a matter of fact, anything I can do to go out and play with my cameras. So it sure I'm beats gonna, work, right? Huh? <laughs> it sure beats work. It beats the heck out of having a real job. I fooled them this long. <laughs> so, uh, and I still love it. You know, after all these years, it's as much fun as ever. So what I'm going to try to do is get the share screen to work and go through some stuff. Um, if you anybody has questions, please feel free to ask and hopefully I'll have an answer. So or at least we can make something up. That's yeah, right. We tell it the way it is. If we don't know how it is, we make it up. Whoops. <laughs> so we don't need that. Let's try to do this. And then I think we're going to. OK, there you are. There I am. That, that's me. Um, that actually was part of a shoot, but I'll explain that later. So let me just get this to go. There we go. So uh, as John said, I've, I've been doing this for just a couple of years now. And um, as I look back on this, it's, you know, I think about covering campaigns and I did, I started with Carter and have done everyone since. And the access you used to get is a lot more than the access you'll get today. And this was fairly obviously early in my career, I was working for Newsweek and literally I'm standing in front of them with a 20 mil, 24 millimeter lens. Let's make sure we get this to go. There it is. Um, you know, back then we were obviously shooting slide film. We would shoot, we would shoot and ship, which to me was my favorite period as a magazine photographer because I'd go spend my whole day making pictures. At the end of the day, I'd have a pocket full of film. I'd go to a restaurant with another photographer and we'd each call a courier and we were done for the day. This uh, Reagan <laughs> and Menachem Begin in the White House. And I've covered the White House a number of times, but it's not really on my regular beat. This was right after Reagan had, had chosen uh, George H.W. Bush to be his vice president. So this was right after the convention. And this was, uh, well, I'm gonna show you how, how one, the, one of the frames from this take ended up. So this was my first Newsweek cover. Um, which to me, it was kind of an amazing concept. I was actually on assignment on New Hampshire primary day to phonograph um, George Bush. And my guy lost uh, and I spent the day with him and I photographed him in the hotel room watching TV, uh, then went down while he gave his concession speech. And then I was theoretically done for the night. So I jumped in my beat up old Volkswagen, drove from Manchester, New Hampshire to Concord, literally dumped my car in a snowbank grabbed my cameras and ran into the room. And anybody who's done this recently knows you can no longer just run into the room. You have to be credentialed for virtually everything. And obviously if it's primary night, you're gonna go through tons of security and probably have to be in place two or three hours. But back then I ran into the room about 15 minutes before uh, Reagan came down and I kind of said, excuse me, excuse me, and made my way to the third row. Um, and I said to the photographers in front of me, if you lean your head left and you lean your head right, I can stick a lens through the middle and make a picture. So the picture that turned into the cover was actually shot with this crop <laughs> and they made it into a cover. And uh, <laughs> I was working for a terrific photo agency back then called Blackstar. And uh, never forget the gentleman who owns Blackstar called me up 
we we shot Tuesday night, shipped early Wednesday morning, and uh, he called me Friday afternoon and said, "How does it feel to have your first Newsweek cover?" To which I calmly responded, "How would I know?" Uh, and it took about twenty minutes to convince <laughs> me that I actually hit the cover. I actually don't remember where I shot this, but obviously this is way back. Um, this is Bush looking like he's telling somebody off. This is one of my favorites. This picture has been published several hundred times. And um, when Bush 41 was president, you know, we'd all go anytime he was in Kennebunkport, Maine, you'd have this great duty. You would go to Kennebunkport, stay in a nice hotel, eat a lot of lobster rolls, and occasionally go hang out with the president. And Bush 41 really liked the photographers, and you just had amazing access. I mean, every time we'd be invited to the house. Another early, this was when he ran against uh, Reagan. This is uh, the two presidents, Bush and uh, Nicholas Sarkozy, who I'm sure at the moment would much rather be on a boat than going to jail. Uh, he was just indicted for something. <laughs> uh, but this was sort of the kind of access you would get. We'd be out there on the press boat and you had the two presidents, Bush and the president of France just bombing around Bush 41 um, had this enormous cigarette boat. It was like, you know, the classic drug runner boat. And he'd go tearing around the harbor in this thing and we'd all go chase him. And this is uh, Bush uh, 43 um, photo, uh, fishing with Putin. And 41 was actually on the boat. He's just not visible in the frame. And it was sort of amazing. I mean, here you had the two presidents, Bush and the president of Russia sitting in this bay fishing and there are photographers sitting up on those rocks taking pictures and um it was just amazing access this uh is called the laughing clintons also uh probably one of my most published photographs this was at an event in some theater in new hampshire i don't know what the joke was but um this picture well, got me quite a number of double spreads Forty-three swearing in, and when you cover the swearing in, and I did them from Reagan's first through Obama's first, um, you have to be in place by six in the morning. You have to be through Secret Service by six, and you're up there on these stands with about a six hundred millimeter lens, and the only thing behind you is like a thirty mile an hour wind, and you're just <laughs> up there until noontime, and then the actual swearing in takes twenty seven seconds. It's amazing how many frames you can fire in 27 seconds out of, how much, out of how many different cameras. And we used to rig remotes all over the place, except for the most part, we'd hardwire them because Secret Service wasn't that thrilled with all the radio frequencies. So obviously right after he is sworn in with one of his daughters. This was uh, uh, inauguration night at one of the inaugural balls. And the two presidents, Bush, watching the parade. And obviously it was pouring that day and I had like the best spot to photograph the parade. There's a, they built a press uh, building and you're just sitting in this building while everybody else is out in the rain. You're sitting there and it's nice and warm in there and they have food and it's a pretty good gig. This is, I call this one Curious George because I think he kind of looks like <laughs> Curious George in this. It's kind of like you mean after we president tomorrow too. <laughs> this um, sort of this tradition up in New Hampshire, every presidential candidate has to go into the Secretary of State's office and sign their forms to be on the ballot, and it's a really, really small room, and it you can see how everybody's just kind of piled in there, and that, boy, this is an event when you're covering it, you need a twenty millimeter lens or wider one of his talks somewhere in New Hampshire, but I don't remember where. This was out in Iowa. So I went out and spent several days traveling uh, with Obama and his family as he was first running out in Iowa. Looks so young there. Yeah, and I, I mean, they were great to work with. I mean, the access was phenomenal, incredibly nice people. Um, it was really delightful. So like I have found over the years of covering presidential candidates in small groups, most of them are really nice. Whether 
you agree with them politically or not. Um, you know, one of the things I think that drew me to doing this kind of work is that you get to spend time early on with somebody who thinks they're eminently qualified to screw up the country. And you really get to talk to them or most of them. Um, and there are situations where you'll just, you know, it'll be a couple of members of the media and the candidate. You just sit around off the record and chat. This was uh, at a bar in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. This event was not on the schedule. Um, he had gone to do something, flown in, done something in Concord, New Hampshire. And I was thinking, he didn't come all this way to do one quick event. And there was nothing else on the schedule. But if you ask a little bit of information from a lot of people, you can piece together what's going on. Um, I got here and I went and prepositioned myself, figured that if this is where he was going, he was going to go to the bar. And everybody kind of thought if I was in the room that I was supposed to be there. So this is one of the pictures that came out of it. I did not get a beer. <laughs> this was um, after uh, Barack and Hillary decided to play nice uh, when she finally decided that he was going to be the nominee and she wasn't. <clears throat> There's a little town up in uh, New Hampshire called Freedom, New Hampshire which I always thought is where the presidential campaigns ought to start. This was the, the same bar. And I, I love this picture. You know, here's this guy who wants to be president, you know, mid bite with a cheeseburger. And this guy in the background who could just care less that the next pre pre president is sitting there. Excuse me. Oops, what happened here? Let me go. Hang on, I got a question. Yes, yeah, Rick. please. Um, so what's the lighting here? The lighting the there light. on, on this one is a little bit of flash fill. Yeah. So uh, on something like this one I'm working, I will have the speed light on the camera. Yeah. Uh, let me see okay. if I can grab something nearby. It just looks like it. a umbrella light. I guess it's bronze light. Okay. No, no, it's, I'll show you. Yeah. It literally would be this. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm familiar. Yeah. So, you know, Stolfen okay. Dome. They've only made this thing for, I don't know, 40 years. <laughs> and then for speed lights, I use Nissan's. Yeah, yeah. No, and I noticed the one where he's pouring the beer, there was a reflection. It looked like an umbrella, but it might have just been a house light. I don't know. Okay, so yeah, this, but yeah. yeah. So, you know, the, what I tell people, the, the key to doing this, you know, is drag your shutter. Yeah, okay. I'm shooting it at a high <laughs> shutter speed. Yeah. This is all going to go black. Yeah, yeah. So I slow shutter speed. If you look at the TV, I obviously didn't hold the camera perfectly still. Oh, that's fine. Um, but he's tack sharp. Yeah, yeah. And, and okay. we can see the folks in the background. Carry on. In those uh, early Reagan photos, do you remember what uh, what film you were shooting? What slide? What film? film? Yes. It probably actor chrome. Thanks. And with a flash of Vivitar 283. Um, and ironically, I down in the studio, there's a, an old, old donkey bag that has half a dozen of them. <laughs> and about a year ago, I thought I'd see these things can't work. And I stuck batteries in them and they all worked. It's like, there was 79 bucks when they came out. There was 75 bucks the whole time they made them. The great little flashes. Do you filter the flashes to match the room color temperature? Um, sometimes. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I mean, that's a one handy here. I didn't really plan on going. There. You know, what I will do is I will have um, on the top of the uh, flash, I'll Velcro a tungsten filter. I usually have a tungsten and a green. So if I need to, you know, cross filter, I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was he had been at, you know, shaking hands at a minor league baseball game and some little kids started making faces at him and he just did it right back. This is a very typical early presidential campaign, you know, where guy wants to be president. This is a diner in Peterborough, New Hampshire. And the guy just walks in, starts shaking hands, you know, some people care, some people could care less. There's a, a saying in New Hampshire, if you ask the, the locals who you're gonna vote for, for president, and the standard answer is, I don't know, I've only met each one three times. And it kind of only, <laughs> you know, it happens in New Hampshire and in Iowa. And 
New Hampshire is a much smaller state to cover than Iowa. You know, a lot of driving in Iowa. So, so this is actually something here in Boston. Just a moment. He's just waiting to go on. This was, um, they were on their way to the inauguration. And I don't can't remember what town I shot this in, but we kind of looked at the train route and drove out to this town. And, you know, it's a whistle stop tour. I thought that meant that they would stop. No, <laughs> train never stopped. It just slowed down and you went bang, 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 and you were done. That, that was it. <laughs> this was, uh, was Obama's almost to the White House on his inauguration day. This is kind of a, during Obama's vacations and Clinton's vacations on the vineyard, you know, like Maine, it was, you'd have to go stay in a nice country inn for two weeks on expense account, you know. And there's that saying, expense accounts are your only chance to do creative writing. So um, <laughs> anyway, with Obama, you know, the way it would work is like they had a press bus and we'd have to meet at the press bus at like 7 a.m. So everybody's kind of groggy to get on the bus with your coffee and sit there for an hour or two. And then this big yellow bus drives part way up the island to a little town and you all get out of the bus and go get more coffee and sit around for an hour or two. And then they stick you in vans because the buses are never in the motorcades. I mean, one, they can't go fast enough uh, and two, security can't see around them. So you'll never see a big bus in a motorcade. So we get out of the bus, get in vans and where you sit in the van, there's actually a protocol depending on who you're working for. It depends on which press van you in, you're in and where you sit. The producers, you stick in the back because they don't have any equipment to get out. You know, the TV, pool TV camera will be, be the first seat in the first van. Um, if you're a magazine photographer, you'll be in the second seat. Um, with Clinton, you know, when the motorcade stopped, I mean, whoever was near the door was getting shoved out the door because with Clinton, we'd go running up to wherever he was and we'd be like 20 cars back in the motorcade. Uh, but you, you know, if you got there fast enough, you'd get a picture. With Obama, it's like, you're not getting out of the van. You know, the agent will get out. There's always a secret service agent in the van with you. That poor agent has the job of being the press agent, meaning he's the liaison between the Secret Service, the protective details, and us. But they'll just get out and stand by the door and just say you're not getting out. And obviously, if they tell you you can't get out, you're not going to get out. So this particular day, you know, we finally go um, get in our vans and we go up island, which I think is actually down. We go up island and we go into another field and we sit around. You get out and they search your equipment <clears throat> and then they give you your day tags and. Uh, I don't know why I have one handy, but they'd give you something that looks like this, and then the color changes per day. So even if you have one, if it's not the right color for that day, they know you're not supposed to be there. And um, we pile back in our van, and we're in the back half of the motorcade. The front half comes out, and we fall in behind them, and then they go to their first stop, and we never get out. And then they inform us that um, we're going to be breaking off from the front of the motorcade. So we follow the front of the motorcade to where the president's going to get out. And then they tell us, stay in the vans and drive us to this field and tell us, okay, he's going to ride a bicycle down that path. So we all kind of line up there. I don't know, probably half a dozen stills and two or three TV crews and a bunch of other people. And every person who rides out of that bicycle path unsuspectingly comes up with this wall of photographers. And of course, we're all practicing. So these people are riding their bicycles and we're all going. Drr, drr, drr. Finally, the president, one of his daughters ride out, never stops, smiles at us, keeps going. So the entire day's work is literally this. Drr, drr. Sure hope it's in focus, end of day. Oh wait, it's not really the end of the day. It's the only time we saw him. We got a lid that day at 11.30 at night, but we never saw him again. So that was our whole day's work. This was um, this was primary night um, four years ago, so he looked happy to see us. This is uh, this past campaign, and I was, this was the uh, the uh, Milford, New Hampshire 
a Labor Day parade, which is about a mile and a half long parade. And Bernie was just in a great mood that day. He ran the whole course, one side of the street to the other. This is about a mile into it. He was joking around with somebody. Uh, Elizabeth Warren and her husband and uh, their dog waiting to be announced to go into an event. And this is, you know, one of those things where I just kind of ask somebody I know, it's like, can I go plaster myself against the wall? Because you're always trying to get something slightly different. <coughs> and uh, Joe coming into one of the campaign events. Mayor Pete, I think this was out in Colorado. Uh, one of the Trump events early in this campaign. You know, and they've got you on a riser when you cover this stuff. And, you know, you're kind of, I mean, the normal lens you're shooting is like a 400 millimeter lens. Um, very, very standard. You're, it's a long, long throw. And, you know, with the Trump folks, uh, it was like, you know, you really can't go anywhere. I mean, sometimes you can get off the riser and stand on the ground. And sometimes you'll be standing right in front of the riser and they'll tell you you can't stand on the ground. I mean, you're nowhere near a security threat. You've already been cleared by Secret Service, but you know, it's up to them. So on stuff like this, I mean, this is probably the lens that I use the most. This is a Tamron 100 to 400, which is just a terrific, reasonably <clears throat> priced lens. And I use this a tremendous amount. Um, one of the things I find out know, a lot of stuff where in the past I might have always taken a 70 to 200. Now I'll take that and, you know, you just see things different with a 400 millimeter lens and it's not very heavy. So all of virtually all the glass I use is all Tamron glass. This is, um, I want to travel like this. So this was actually um, uh, Trump arriving for his last campaign event in New Hampshire. And when I go and cover these events, you know, I know like, like you can, they want the stills in the back row. And if you're going to go set up, you know, you can put on a ladder up there and put your laptop on it so you can work. I'm not on that kind of deadline. I'm not a wire photographer. And I never want to be in that back row because you can't move. You're just stuck there. There are just too many people trying to do too many things. So I'll tend to go, you know, towards the edges of a riser and try to be near the stairs. <clears throat> um, you know, when they said the plane's coming and you could see the plane, sorry, that backlight's in your eyes. Um, you could see the plane come in. That's when I got off the riser and went and found this angle and then just leaned on the drive as it came in. This one, I always felt like you could write your own cut line, like what is Oprah saying? We kind of get out of politics and do a little of the other stuff. Um, Tony okay. Bennett was just one of the nicest people to work with. He was just terrific. This was uh, shot during the Montreal Jazz Fest and he had performed. And then I was supposed to have, you know, five minutes to photograph him. And he said, well, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like you to perform for me. And he said, okay, I'll perform for you. So I had a couple of minute personal Tony Bennett concert. <clears throat> this was done for People Magazine. And um, it was amazing. Sir Anthony shows up for the photo shoot by himself. There's no entourage, there's no security. I had to be set up in a certain hotel room at exactly seven o'clock. And with the celebs, you get the do's and don'ts list, <clears throat> pardon me, and his entire don'ts list, which you can't have anybody on set who's not working. So if I need five PAs, I can have them, but I can't bring my mother unless she can carry lights. <laughs> uh, now he was terrific to work with. This is basically one, one Dino light head <clears throat> with a uh, kind of a medium Chimera softbox. And as the ambient light is dropping in the background, you know, I'm dropping that shutter speed, just get a tiny bit of light coming through that curtain. You're a Nikon guy, is that right? Nikon cameras, correct. Yeah, yes. so uh, John Shields was asking about the new Canon 800 millimeter fixed F11 that weighs nothing. And, you know, it, it's so easy to shoot with them. I was just wondering, he's wondering if that's gonna change the way some of these campaign things. Are done 800 no yeah i don't think so yeah <clears throat> i mean you know you're gonna be just you're gonna be so i mean <laughs> no 
I, I don't think so. I mean, I'd like to believe that we're going to continue to have reasonable access, at least with some candidates. <clears throat> you know, I mean, the amount of access gets less and less with each yeah. go round. You know, I mean, it was interesting. This time in New Hampshire, nobody had Secret Service other than the president. But they all had their own private security. And, you know, I mean, you had reasonably good access um, once you kind of, you know, I mean, I find who the security guys are and go up and introduce myself and say, look, if I happen to be slightly in your way, I'm Rick, just say Rick moving, I'm gone. And that little bit of not challenging them and saying, yes, you're right, I'm going to deal with what you want. Inevitably, you get away with all sorts of stuff. Um, this picture goalie was also done for people many years ago. And I loved it. You know, I, I had my time slot and this was done at a bookstore up the street from my studio, which is, we're located in one of those old brownstones in the south end of Boston. And uh, so I walk up to where the shoot is and I always go early and, you know, I'm one of those photographers that when you show up on, a, on location, you're not opening cases and taking stuff out, you're ready to go. And I show up early and she walks out of the back room and sees an old friend. And that's the picture that came out of it. Um, you know, I knew I had my picture, but I still wanted to spend my half hour with Goldie Hawn. <laughs> this is called Three Guys on a Couch. And, um, you know, this is one of those things. This is flash on camera where we balance the outside and the inside with one speed light. And, you know, um, you know if everybody knows who these three folks are, it's quite mind boggling that Keith Richards is the only one left. But Keith Richards and Chuck Berry had a long standing disagreement. And um, this whole thing was amazing. I, when I got there, Chuck Berry was the only guy in the room. So he introduced me to everybody who came in like we were good friends. And, you know, at one point uh, I was, Keith Richards looks at me and I'd been introduced. He goes, hey, Rick. And it was like, I know he's going to do something. I don't know what. He's going to do something and it's going to be really fast. And I got off two frames of this. And this one, it's, I Elvis. always love this one. Where Paul Simon's trying to entertain Chuck Berry and Elvis Costello is eavesdropping. And who this young woman is under the portrait of RFK, nobody seemed to know who, how she got into the room. But all I could think of is she's on the phone to like her girlfriend's going, and these old people are so rude. This was great. Elvis Costello is uh, playing a, one of Chuck Berry's songs and he gets done playing and everybody's kind of, you know, in amazement. And Chuck Berry looks up and goes, play another. And you may be a major rock star, but if Chuck Berry said play another of my songs, he was going to play another one. So uh, Elvis Costello says, well, I need another guitar player. And people in the audience start chanting, Keith, 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 like you're trying to get a buddy to go get a pizza. <laughs> and unrehearsed, the two of them got up there and jammed for 20 minutes. It was absolutely surreal. This is the epitome of, and I got paid for doing this. This was uh, more behind the scenes with, with him and his glass of Fanta. And then I go, well, but they just came up to me and did this. This is um, John Ratzenberger, um, alias Cliff yes. Clavin from Cheers. Mm -hmm. And um, I had worked on a TV series. I, I have done a fair number of stills for movies and television shows. And this was a project I was working on with John called Made in America where we just travel around the country and go to traditional American manufacturing. And I saw this sign and this is another one, you know, you know, he's going to do something, just be ready. And um, this is what he did. This, I, I love, this is, um, we all know who this is. And um, I think Keiko's listening somewhere. Keiko Hiromi is my shooting partner. And uh, anyway, we had this uh, assignment to go photograph uh, Bill Gates and um, we got there and, you know, they told us to set up two hours early and wait in the hallway. And we said, fine, we'll be back pl in plenty of time, but I'm not going to sit in the hallway and wait for you. Not him, but his PR people. And uh, anyway, we got there and we're chatting briefly with him. And Keiko says, uh, do you have keys in your pocket? So he's feeling to see if he has keys in his pocket. Like he drove himself to the photo shoot. But he, you know, he was great to work with for the few minutes we had. This is... um. This is great. I get this assignment from a magazine that I've worked for for many years. And editor calls me up and says, Rick, I need you to go over to Harvard and photograph a couple of kids with their computers, to which I said, you mean MIT? And she went, no, Harvard, hold on. 
silence, silence, silence. She gets back on and goes, oh, darn, that's not really what she said. I'm late for a meeting. Uh, go take a picture of the skid Mark Zuckerberg and his roommate. Here's his phone number. And that's the picture of Mark Zuckerberg at Harvard. Again, this has been published oh, easily a couple hundred times. You know, one of the things, you know, in depending on who you work for, but if you work freelance as a photojournalist, you own the rights to what you shoot. So I own about 95% of what I've ever shot. Um, the only stuff I really don't own is when I, when I work on a film or a television production, in which case the, produce, the production company owns the rights and you know that going in. This is John Updike, who I just loved working with. It was just, I did something with John. I had the honor of photographing him about half a dozen times. And the last time I got to be with him, I, so I did something I really never do, which is to ask for an autograph. So I have a signed copy of Rabbit Run. And about a week after I did this shoot, I get this little onion skin envelope in the mail, written in fountain pen and the return address is Pride's Crossing Mass. And I'd been to John's house, so I knew that's where he lived. And I couldn't think of anybody else who would write me in fountain pen. Anyway, he wrote me the nicest thank you note for coming to take his picture. This is, um, oh. I'm blank gonna blank on the man's name. Forgive me. Um, I hate when I do that. Yeah, really. Especially when it's my guest. Well, <laughs> what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had to illustrate the fact that um, he'd written a book on eating healthy. His name is Ray Kurzweil. I'm glad my brain has returned. And Ray is really known as one of the fathers of artificial intelligence, but he wrote a book about eating healthy and how long you'll live. So we wanted to do a portrait of, based around that. So this is Ray lying on his office floor <laughs> and he's lying on a blue backdrop and all the food is on a plexiglass table. Yep. So we him. went in and we got it set up and brought the stuff to make the plexiglass table and got there and everything looked great until I did the first test shot with the assistant underneath it. And the problem was the entire white drop ceiling was reflected in the plexi. Normal solution might be to change your angle, not when you have food that's gonna roll away. So we ended up taking a long roll of black backdrop paper and covering his entire drop ceiling in black paper. And then I went and I put on black gloves and a hat, a dark hat, and kind of held the camera in front of my face, and eventually we hit it. This is a professor at MIT, um, and Keiko and I walked in there, and as we're walking in, they have a periodic table on the wall of the building. It's lit with one fluorescent tube, and it's like, we know we're going to use this, but this is not what it's going to look like. So by the time we were done with it, we have several dyno lights up and a couple of speed lights and a bunch of gels. This uh, is a piece I did for Sports Illustrated on Rob Gronkowski, um, who was, uh, he was great to work with. You know, this is one of those things, the PR guy is going, you got eight minutes, come on, you got eight minutes. And Gronk's like, yeah, I'm having fun, leave me alone. So this is Gronk helping me edit the take and it's the only time in a long time that I felt small. Notice the pink pocket wizard. I actually have a pink pocket wizard too. I was just going to point that out. <laughs> They're great. You don't forget them. Right. And people and notice if you teach it. workshops. Nobody can walk off with them because yeah. there aren't that many of them. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually Keiko, my shooting partner. There yeah, she is in the lower corner. Oh, well. I, I can't see her on, on my screen, but um, this is a. You know, when, when we have time, we go into the studio and we call the studio on um, the photographic test kitchen. Mm -hmm. And that's what we just, we go in and we practice shoots and play around and come up with lighting, <coughs> excuse me. And so this one, this is all Nissan speed lights. Um, the backlight has a grid on it. The light on Keiko's face. And we used a grid, but we took uh, a flash bender, which is about this long. And normally you, you would use it as a reflector. We rolled it up and made it a long snoot. A snoot. Yep. <clears throat> then stuck the grid on it, um, put some tough spun over the end of it to soften the light out. And that was the light we came up with. 
And this is uh, this one's called Three Keikos. <laughs> and um, this is one single frame. And <clears throat> what we had done on this one is, well, first of all, Fat Me is standing behind Skinny Her. So the camera's on a tripod. I've got a pocket wizard to release the fire the camera. And we have it marked out so that Keiko, we fire one frame, she moves, we fire another frame, she moves. And then I'm standing behind her. And this, what I'm using for a light back here, that is a, called a Savage Wand. And you can actually say, that's what John's using ironically um, on his. Um, let me see if I can show you this. So you can, you take this. There it is. And you can actually control it from your phone. So I'm going to come here and I actually, the light I'm using to light me is a Savage Light Panel, which is a really great video light. But the, the wand, so let me see, I'm going to activate the wand and that should work. And now, let me just see. Did I get red hair? No, I didn't. What did I didn't do it right. Magic wand. I always love when I go to do this. There it goes. Okay. So you can see the light changing in the background. And the way John has it set, his is set on automatic. So it'll just keep changing colors. Yeah. So here, what I'm doing is this is a, a time. Bring it exposure. into the frame here. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we can have dueling ones. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> These are great. This thing's about 160 bucks. This is a really inexpensive piece of equipment. So what I've done it because it's a fairly long exposure, I think we're about eight seconds. I'm standing behind Keiko and I'm just twirling this thing around, uh, which is what gave me this pattern. This is uh, also done in the photographic test kitchen. And um, this was the cover of my first lighting kit. So. This is the current one. Um, and what that had, that has 24 gels in it and a sheet of tough spawn and a sheet of cine foil. Cine foil is black tin foil, just great light shaping tool. But um, <clears throat> on this particular picture, well, let me jump. Yeah, here's the behind the scenes. So first of all, the photographic test kitchen's really small. Like I said, we're in a, a brownstone in Boston. So but you can see what our lighting setup was. So I've got a Nissan speed light with a, um, a rogue flash bender on it. And I've made it into a strip light. And then there's another one over here with a grid on it with an orange gel. And then the screen in the background, I've got a blue gel back there. And you see the pattern here? That was created in a very technical way. I took the light with the blue gel and stuck it in front of a plant. And then I love the fact that when Keiko made this slide for me, that um, she felt it was necessary to tell you who is Hiana and who is Rick so you don't get us mixed up. <laughs> <clears throat> I just, uh, last week, published an article on, on photo focus on easy high key. So simple way to do high key lighting. This particular one, the background, I have like a 30, I don't know, 36 inch octa directly behind the model is Juliana Nicole, who I've worked with for years. It's directly behind Juliana's head. It's two stops brighter than my front light. That's going to give me a pure white background. And then if you look at the catch lights in Juliana's eyes, we actually did that with a uh, Savage ring light. So the back light is strobe and the front light is LED. And I'm just, you know, balancing out my exposure. But it's a real simple way. If you need high key, you know, uh, that's the way to do it. If you like I said, look on photofocus.com and you or or go to my site, rickfriedman.com, and look at my blog, and you can see a couple of different examples of how to do this. This is something we do quite a bit. Um, this model, other than the fact that this girl desperately needs to eat a cookie, um, this young lady is standing in front of a pure white backdrop. And what I've done is I've taken a piece of cine foil and we've cut a pattern out of the black tin foil. I've put that in front of a speed light. So I'm now shooting the light onto the backdrop. Now I've created my pattern. And then I just took four different colored gels and just taped them onto the background. And then I light the model 
with I've got a soft box on her and I have a go boat off because I don't want the light on the model to hit the background. If you're playing around with projections or using television monitors or any, you know, I, I do a lot of taking a projector, plugging it into my laptop and projecting backgrounds that way. Um, the light hitting your model can't hit your background because it'll blow away your colors. Or as I put it, if white light hits your colors, it blows away your colors. So we just take that light, put a grid on it or an egg crate, put some cine foil on it and make sure that none of this light is hitting our model here. This was during a workshop that I was teaching. Um, this is in Birmingham, England. This was part of a, a tour that I did for SWPP, uh, which is one of the British Photographic Societies. And they very nicely have asked me to come over to teach from time to time. And then I've gone over and done their conventions. But uh, hey, we're, we're out there and I'm working with this model who's obviously wicked tall. And um, I am sitting literally in the roadway. <clears throat> and I've got her, this is a two speed light picture. I have one speed light through a small softbox to illuminate the model. And then her shoes were going too dark. And I just took another speed light and I literally just put it on the ground in front of me and took my cine foil and made a tent out of this. So my light wouldn't flare up and I could control it. So that's how we lit her. She's a terrific model to work with. This is a quick two light setup. Um, uh, just a, a seven inch grid in the background with a CTO filter on it to give us this beautiful highlight. The first day of the shoot, she came in, she spent three hours straightening her hair. And it was like, don't straighten your <laughs> hair, leave it like that. So it's just a quick two light setup. This one here, I'm gonna show you how we did it. Um, <clears throat> we teach some small workshops here at, at the studio and out back, we have this little courtyard. And so this is, uh, well, there's your set for that photograph. So here's my neighbor's Jeep. Here's my parking space. Here's the Roscoe Fogger. Here's our model. The blue light in the background, the, the pocket wizard hanging off of it. And that's what we end up with. This was actually, I was teaching a workshop at a wonderful camera store in New Jersey called Unique Photo. And they always say, we want you to do it in the classroom or the studio. It's like, no, I want to be on the loading docks so I can play with the smoke and the colors. And this is just one of the models we worked with out there. And obviously the fogger is here, you know, and then put a blue gel on it. And that's what you end up with. This is a, another picture of Juliana. Um, this was actually done. We were teaching a workshop at B&H at the, um, the event space at B&H. And what's interesting about this, the background here on this, this is a role of Translum. Translum is um, a product put out by Savage and it mm -hmm. comes like a roll of backdrop paper, except it's a translucent material. So you yeah. can blow light through it. You can change the I think the they color have three different thicknesses, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's great stuff. Matter of fact, this backlight was too bright. So we actually stuck some Translum on it to soften it out. Mm -hmm. So I use it as a diffusion material, but I'll also use it as backgrounds. This one, the, uh, the assignment comes in and they say, go do a portrait of this ultimate Frisbee player. She'll be in Boston next week for a couple of minutes. It's like, you want a, a headshot or do you want a portrait of her? So we talked to her and went out to UMass and at Blue Hour shot this photograph and we lit her, it's got two Dynalites one on either side of her. We placed them intentionally to get this drop off in the foreground. And then, and I was saying, you start your exposure with the element you can't control. My exposure is controlled by what the sky is doing. I can dial my lights up and down. I can't dial the sky up and down. This was uh, also part of the, um, uh, the SWPP tour. Uh, we were in, Car Philly, Wales, I think is where we were. And, and shocking, it was raining that day in Wales. I think it's no. raining every day in Wales. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I had a great looking model and a slinky red dress and a castle for a background. And I don't get many castles for background. So <laughs> I'm going out to shoot. So we go out and it's slate gray out. So, and this, we lit this model with one speed light. But this is cross filtering. So 
We all know that if we go outside and it's gray and your camera's in daylight, you get ugly gray sky. But if you put your camera on tungsten, now your ugly gray sky is blue. Underexposed, it, it'll come out a little bluer. Then take your CTO filter, color temperature orange filter, put it over your speed light. Now your speed light or your strobe and your camera are now color balanced and anything the flash is not hitting will now have the effect of the tungsten setting on the camera. And that's how we came up with that. This was, uh, we were teaching a workshop at one of my all time favorite photo events. I've had the honor to go a couple of times. This is an event called Exposure and it's in Sharjah, United Arab Emirates. And if you ever have a chance to go, it is an amazing photo event. And the folks who put it on say, you know, we don't have to make any money at this event. We have to put on a great event. In other words, His Excellency has plenty of money and His Excellency is paying the bill. And um, they bring in between 30 and 40 photographers from around the globe to teach these workshops. And they brought in this model, I think she came from the Ukraine, um, to come in and model for me. So we went to part of the old city and just played around out there. But um, you go to this event and the presenters have exhibits and I have never seen my work printed that big. And it was just, it was magnificent. So uh, anyway, it's a great event. It's, well, it's normally in November. They just had one like a week, two weeks ago though. This is, uh, we're down in, um, we're down in Melbourne Beach, Florida on this one. And the idea was not to do this picture, but we're walking down the beach and this boat had washed up and it was obviously abandoned. And then I'm looking at the angle of this thing, I'm thinking I can't stand on this, but I have a 16 year old model, she can stand on it. And um, this is a one speed light picture. So we were able to balance out the ambient light here. Obviously the model would have been in shadow had we not hit it with a speed light. And I literally just took one Nissan speed light and just had somebody hold it over here for me and fired it off with a pocket wizard. So this is uh, the wonderful Juliana again. This was uh, another unique workshop and um, you know, this one, we've got the fogger going, we've got several lights that are gelled. And with that hair, it's just, you can do all sorts of fun things. This is another one where we created the background ourselves. This was shot actually on the show floor at Photo Plus in New York. Um, with this wonderful model I like working with, you know, great models make us look good. You give them an idea, and they know how to do it. Or as I discover, you know, and I'll say this to the models, look, we have, we're like making a single frame movie. We have one frame to tell the whole story and you are the star of this movie. Now do it. <laughs> and uh, so it's similar sort of thing though. You know, we've got the projected background. We have a speed light behind her with a rogue grid on it and a purple gel on that rogue grid. And then we've lit her with a strip light. And again, we've go boat it off so it doesn't hit the background. This is the cover of the lighting kit I showed you. Um, and this, this lighting kit now actually is packaged in plastic bags rather than that nice box. Cause we were able to put more gels in and charge less money. So this has 24 gels in it. And this one's right outside the studio. Um, we've lit the model. I have a, uh, a Dynalite Baja strobe with an extension tube on it and then a 10 degree grid. And then I even wrapped the end of that in cinefoil. So I really want to control where this light's going. <clears throat> then to soften the light out, I'll take some tough spun, which looks like a dryer sheet. Um, and you know, normally you would tape it over. In this case, I just crumple it up in a ball and stuff it inside the cinefoil. So it's really softening my light out. So now I have her lit. Now I need to light this wall. and. This one um, for the background, I took a two foot square piece of cinefoil and I literally just tore holes in it and I taped colored gels over the holes and made sure that this light is not hitting my model. So it's, I call it lighting and elements. I want this element to, this part of the picture to be one separate lighting set up from this. So this so you have the Baja as I'm the sorry? main light. For this one, you have the Baja. The, the Baja is the, the, right. the main light. Is, is that a speed light or another Baja on the background? No, this is a speed light. 
And Michael was asking, how many watt seconds are those speed lights? They're just little like 60, 70. Yeah. Yeah, about that. Yeah, I bought, you know, I'm amazed. I mean, I have, like, we we did a piece, uh, Keiko and I did a piece the other day for uh, the Washington Post magazine. And, you know, we went ready to light everything. We brought half a dozen Dynalite heads with us. We were just ready to go. We used one speed light the whole day. That was it. You know, it's sometimes it's it's the right what's the right hammer for the job. Right. And there the is no one right answer. Yeah, speed lights are deceptive because they have that Fresnel lens on the front that concentrates the light. So in the center of the frame, the speed light is sometimes brighter than my studio strobes. Yeah. But then it falls off quickly. Yeah. I mean, and we'll use, size. you know, these these have built-in zoom heads. Mm -hmm. these, so we'll use that. We'll use rogue grids a tremendous amount. I mean, rogue grids are just, you know, they're inexpensive little grid sets. It's three grids. And of course, I don't really have one handy. There's probably one. I'm talking to somebody I work with. Uh, but you'll just, <coughs> excuse me, you just mount it right on here. Yep. And it's a great set. There might be one in that think tank case in the hallway. So let me carry on a little bit. So this was, um, again, part of that SWPP or the society's workshops and we were out shooting on the streets of London and we kind of get there and we're doing this shot but you know <coughs> same location hold on a second Karen could you bring me some water please thank you um but if I slow my shutter speed down and zoom my lens I go from this to this This was, um, I was teaching a workshop, <coughs> pardon me, at Unique on the loading dock. And um, the guy who runs the store said, you got to see this huge background I had painted. To which he said, I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. So we stuck the background up, <coughs> pardon me. And um, the gentleman who was assisting me that day drove his motorcycle up on the loading dock. And we put this picture together. And again, we've got, the two models are lit with Dynalites, with Octas. Um, I've got a, 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 a light on the model's hair. This is a speed light. The front lights are Dyna. Actually, no, the front lights were not Dynas. They were Hensels is what they were, which are terrific lights. This How did one you get the where, motorcycle um, to stand up? I'm sorry? How did you get the motorcycle to stand up? Oh, it's just on the kickstand. You just photoshopped it out. The kickstand's no, I, on the I other think side. I can see it there. Yeah, you can see it in the background. Damn. But, you know, in a picture awesome. like this, I certainly would not be above photoshopping it out. Um, the editorial pictures that I shoot for the magazines, you know, if it is a news assignment, you cannot add, you cannot take away. So if there's a wire coming out of your subject's head, too bad you goofed up but you cannot add or take anything out. But on this kind of picture, obviously I could. So thank you. Um, and Karen's just brought a couple of things in I can share with you. So this is what the, um, the rogue grids look like. And they have a little adapter so you can mount it on the end of your flash. And when you buy it, it comes with a couple of these inserts and you put Careful, them together and you make a narrower a insert. And um, they're also very good as coasters to put scotch glasses on. Yeah, I'm just stopping the share for a second so people can see you large so you can hold them up again. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So this is what the grid looks like. Okay. Uh, anyway, so it'll come with a couple of these comes with a holder. I think it's about a $45 item. Um, the whole thing flattens out and I always throw these in the back of my camera bag. If I'm going to be using this and I want to do gels with this, they actually make a set of cutout gels. Uh, as much as I'd like you to buy the ones that I have, <laughs> these are easier for this purpose. And then the other thing that I really quickly, so this is what a flash bender looks like. And it's actually designed to be like a small softbox that goes on top of your speed light. And they're literally called flash benders. 
because you can bend them. <laughs> but on the picture, that's got a diffusion panel on the front and a silver reflector. And then that photograph that I showed you of Keiko in the hat. So what we did is we just took one of these, and it's got Velcro on it. And we just stuck the grid on the end of this. And now I've got a long extension too. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> so that's what that is. Let's see what's next on the hit parade. So, share screen look, again. Share screen again. Okay, there we go. <coughs> so how has this past year been for you with the cold COVID thing? Has it slowed you down or you've been still busy? Oh, no. Well, it's certainly uh, kind of taken a bite out of in-person workshops. Mm -hmm. um, all of those were canceled. Um, I have my first, I'm very excited about this, my first in-person workshop. Um, is will be at it's April 16th and 18th and it's called the Can-Am Photo Expo um, up in just up in Buffalo and it's going to be um, it's going to be easy it's going to be a hybrid workshop so the majority of the attendees will be online um, most of the instructors will be based out of uh, Doug Hansgate's studio Doug Hensgate is just a terrific, terrific photographer. If you don't know his work, look at it. H-A-N-S-G-A-T-E. Uh, Maverick, this next picture I've got up here, we shot at Doug's studio. And um, so I'm going to have some folks who are going to come and we're going to meet at locations and do an outdoor shoot. Um, I've started the vaccination process. So by the time this event happens, I will be done. Uh, so that's really the first one that we're doing. And then... At the end of May, uh, I'm going to do a workshop with Rick Farrow, which uh, we're dubbing the Rick and Rick Show. And we have rented the classic car museum of St. Augustine, Florida. And this is like we've rented this museum. And the title of the workshop is Cars, Cameras, and Models. And they've got 85 to 100 classic cars in there. And they said, any car you want to use, we'll move it wherever you want it. And on top of that, they have an enormous studio there. So they have a big corner site wall that's 25 yeah. feet long to photograph all these, you know, half million dollar cars. It should be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to that one. Great. So anyway, this particular picture um, we did up, like I said, at Doug Hansgate's studio. And uh, this was actually done with hot lights. This was done with old frezzy lights and uh, a fogger and... Um, <clears throat> You know, if you're using fog machines inside, you kind of need to know where the smoke detectors are. <laughs> um, Doug's studio doesn't have any smoke detectors in the actual studio space. And the studio is, I love the studio. He bought an enormous old church. So the studio is this classic old church. It's the only person I know who has like a 60 foot ceiling in their studio. Yeah, I tried to buy a church a few years ago, but my wife talked me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so you know, if you ever get a chance to do a workshop up there, he, yeah, I know there's he does a, church a lot of stuff four online. blocks from my house that's for sale right now, and she won't even let me walk by. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me go. Whoops, come here. There. This is back to that same loading dock at Unique Photo. Um, and again, it's just, just a roll down garage door, is all our background is. And I love it. This dancer's name is Zoe Snowball, and that's actually her name. <clears throat> and uh, she's from the Joffrey and uh, we had her come out and be one of our models for the day so obviously you can tell how we lit it you know you can see in here we've got this light coming in here so there's a light coming this way but it's very gridded because I don't want the light coming this way to blow away this shadow that I just put there so again I do a lot with controlled lights <clears throat> This was, um, I was teaching a workshop. This was a tough one. Somebody said to me, um, it's going to be February in Boston. Now, do you want to go to Costa Rica and photograph pretty models on the beach? And I'm thinking, I could stay home and shovel ice in the alley. And I thought about it, I think I'll go to Costa Rica. So uh, anyway, this is, it is literally F nothing out there. I mean, it is just the only bit of ambient light is this teeny bit of gold light on the horizon. It's like, don't put anything down. You'll never find it. Um, and we lit her, um, we've got, uh, with a light called a Hensel Porty, 
which is a, a terrific portable stove, as long as you have an assistant to carry a power pack that's like carrying a car battery or two. It's like, sure, you say to the assistant, well, we know you're walking barefoot through the water, but here, carry this car battery. <laughs> I'm not, I'm gonna fire it with a pocket wizard. Anyway, so obviously it's long exposure. The model is illuminated when the strobe fires and then you let the background burn in. This is actually Karen who's in the room uh, helping me out here. Yeah, Michael had a question. Hi, Michael, what can I do? When, when you say a long exposure, define that. Ah, um, I think this one's probably about four seconds. Really? But yeah, when I do long exposure, I mean, they're all over the place. You know, I mean, I can do them for minutes. Um, but with people quite often, you know, I'll do them five, set four or five seconds. But remember, as long as the subject isn't illuminated, right? So this background is burning in. So as long as the subject's not illuminated, if she moves, she moves, we're not going to see it. She's only recorded when we fire the strobe. Does that make any sense? Yes. Good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. This silhouette, this was after um, WPPI in Vegas. We're at a Valley of Fire. You know, because what do photographers do to relax? We go take pictures. Of course. Yeah. This is another one shot in a little courtyard uh, out behind the studio. And um, this was the main light on our model here. Now, let me explain. I call the courtyard behind the studio, I call it the lower 40. In my case, it's feet. So it's 22 feet wide, 40 feet long, but probably a third of that is garden. So it's not a big space to work. And um, so we've illuminated the model with a strip light. And then I've made barn doors on the side of the strip light because I only want to illuminate her. So I want it when I fire that test shot that she's illuminated, everything else is black. Oh yeah, this is three o'clock in the afternoon. So we got to overpower all the daylight. And then all these other lights that you're seeing, these are all Nissan speed lights. There are a couple of them literally super clamped up in the trees here. Uh, each one has a different gel on it. There's another one just by the fogger. And I use a Roscoe fogger, it's phenomenal. Um, and that, that's how it's done. And then she's holding a lantern. And then I have these little, these tiny little strobes. They're like 25 watt seconds. And they're little and they come in different odd shapes. And whenever I see them in a store, I'll buy a couple because they're, and you usually use, you might use them in one shoot once, but you know, for the 35 bucks it costs you to have, it's worth having it. So that's what that little light is. This is um, one building over. So this is the alley. And this is in the middle of the afternoon again. And you can see, you know, there's our, our daylight back here. And then we've got a whole bunch of gridded lights with gels on them. And we're just blowing light all over the alley. And, you know, my neighbors think I'm a little nuts. This is, we saw this model earlier again. This was, um, again, I think Photo Plus. And again, that projected background. And I, I literally have her leaning on a Flexville. Mm -hmm. And when the light came on, I mean, this picked up the colors and this didn't. Sure, she's blocking it, yep. Yeah, yeah. This was the uh, first time I ever worked with this model. We've worked together a lot since. I was teaching at um, Professional Photographers of New York State, I think it's, I think I've got all the words thrown in there. <laughs> and I love it, they're wonderful people. And they said, well, y'all teach lighting workshops from, um, 9 to 12 30 and then from 1 30 to 4 30 it's like this is july it's like what about the good light <laughs> so i ended up just adding another session each day to my workshops so this is uh we obviously have lit this whole thing and cassandra you know is is lit we've added all these gels got that fogger going back there this is one uh, another one of the ones from um exposure in UAE, and we just went to another part of the old city that was they were starting to rebuild it, and just had the model stand there, hit her with one strobe, again balance 
strobe light with my available light. I tend to like to underexpose my backgrounds a little bit. And that's what we end up with. This is literally in the parking lot at Unique Photo. <laughs> Just jump model. <laughs> And it was like the sun, this is not a strobe. The sun was beaming through the trees. And all I had to do was add the smoke so you could see it. So by adding the smoke, we picked up all of this. This is down in the studio. Yeah. Um, again, just playing around with the different lighting setups. You know, obviously we've got a, I actually, I have the light behind me is the light behind her, giving her the red hair. This is my bartender, literally. <laughs> We're sitting there. When I have a cocktail, I said, you got to get in front of the camera. This is the first time the guy had ever been in front of a camera. It was the very first time. <clears throat> and again, you know, we stick the blue light behind him to give him all this rim, rim light, turn that backlight up another stop. And then if you look at him, you see the highlights and shadows in here? So what I've done is on the main light, I've taken a piece of cine foil and I cut this one out so it looks like window slats. Yep. And I shot the light through it. And then how hard my edges are in the shadows depends on the distance from the light to the screen. Sure, the closer it is to the subject, the harder those edges are going to be. Right. The closer yep. it is to the light, the softer they're going to be. Yeah, so I'm forever hanging, you know, booms with super clamps on them <laughs> out in front of you know strobes yeah, super clamps are one of my weaknesses i have 20 of them in the basement here <laughs> if you need more let me know i have too many because those <laughs> are those things either you have way too many or, or you can't enough. find any exactly right. in which case oh i ran out i better get a few more yeah i had 16 I have... on one set once that's why i started the collection <laughs> and i still needed more I have toolboxes full of this stuff. <laughs> so this is uh, the same model I showed you in, on the purple picture. And this was um, at the Can-Am a couple of years ago. And up in Buffalo, they have these old battleships that you can like just go on and play. So I'm on one battleship photographing Cassandra. And I told her what the shoot was going to be. And it was her idea to show up with the uniform. Buffalo just doesn't sound like it's on a coast. How'd they get the boats there? <laughs> <laughs> They got a lake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it, this wasn't bad. At least it wasn't too cold. <clears throat> now, we've done these workshops out there. The Can-Am is an annual event. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've done them when it's been awfully cold. This day wasn't too bad. This is also in the bow, one of those battleships. This was two years ago. <clears throat> and to see how this model has grown as a model in two years is incredible. So now there are the Costa Rica ones. Yeah, this was just a tough day at the office, you know? I can see. Yeah, another day of, gee, you know, I, I can think of so many jobs. Do I want to do this? Do I want to sell life insurance? I think I'll do this. Um, <clears throat> this was um, Newsweek um, needed a picture of fireworks over the Statue of Liberty, um, and they thought it might um, run as a cover. And they went and they hired, I think, I don't know, eight or 10 photographers. And Blackstar called them up and said, well, you got to put Rick on. And they said, oh, we're sorry. We already have too many photographers. So, um, you know, I went and shot it anyway. And I got another one of those phone calls about, you know, how does it feel to have a Newsweek cover? Personally, I like this picture a lot better than the one they read on the cover. But I wasn't really going to complain. And essentially, you know, back then when you got a cover, they literally would send you a case of covers. Now, if you have a cover, you get to go buy the magazine. This is the uh, uh, Kennedy Library. Just inside the library, looking up at the flag. I do a lot of work at the Kennedy Library. Or I did, you know, you asked me, you know, <laughs> how's work going? Well, I certainly haven't done anything at the Kennedy Library in a year. You know, normally I would do a lot of work at Harvard. Obviously, there's no work at Harvard. Yeah. And this was when uh, we used to have teams in Boston that won things. <laughs> We've gotten over that, but uh, this is Copley Square at, um, one at the Red Sox parade. And um, <coughs> I love covering these things because this is like three blocks from the studio. Like they park the TV trucks further away than where I have to walk from. This is, um, <coughs> we had an assignment a couple of years ago <coughs> and um, I did a story 
um, on a big cat rescue reserve. So this is one of the pictures of the big cat rescue reserve. I was going to say those didn't look like cats in the first one. No, well, it was interesting. <laughs> so the client calls me up and I'm thinking, first of all, you know, when you think of great wildlife photographers, I do not come to mind. <laughs> you know, it's just, I, you know, I do something. Anyway, they wanted somebody who might I have a slightly different approach. It was wonderful. Um, but they wanted me to get off the plane. Let me see, to fly from Boston to Atlanta, Atlanta to Joburg, um, and go to work the next morning. Like get there late at night. Go, and it's like, I, I, can't, I can't, you know, wrong time zone. So uh, we went a bunch of days early and went down and spent several days in Cape Town and went off to see the penguins. And these guys posed for me. And this is that same Tamron 400 that uh, yeah. I showed Just you earlier. Just before you go on to the cat, Stephen Gotts was asking, how do you manage to have such great skies on the days you hire models? What's your connection? Oh, I, I tell the models they're only working if it's a great sky. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, obviously there is. You know, you got to go with what you got to go with. And then yeah. you try to try to figure it out. I mean, today, obviously, depending on the program you're using, you know, anybody processing in Luminar, Luminar AI knows how hard it is to change a sky. Yeah, well, which obviously in a news picture I can't do, but <clears throat> um, and that's main. I'm mainly processing in Luminar AI now. It's just it's a terrific program, and yeah, just push button, change sky. <laughs> you know. but anyway, these guys Go were just the posing. Yeah, to the kitties. Yeah, this was actually the last day we were there. This is um, uh, part of uh, an organization called Four Paws. <clears throat> and they run animal rescue reserves, a number of them around the globe. And they go into these god-awful private zoos and, and war zones, and they rescue these animals. Nice. Um, these guys have never lived in the wild. Um, they wouldn't probably survive in the wild. But they live, believe it or not, these guys are actually in a pen. But you can't see either side of it. It's somewhere, I mean, they have, you know, just huge areas. Um, they're just sort of amazing. I was looking for something for a lead picture in the last morning. You know, this just happened. <clears throat> After we did the uh, the other story, um, we went down or went up, went back to uh, Johannesburg <coughs> and then flew up to Skokosa um, and went to a place called Mala Mala. And um, just... I'd always wanted to do a real safari. And this was an amazing place. Um, you know, if you're going to do a safari, I mean, the advice that I can give anybody, one, this was a great place to go. But if you do it, you know, you you don't want to go with a large crowd. You don't want to share a Land Rover. If you're going to spend all the money to get there, spend a little bit of extra money and have your own Land Rover and request that your guide is a photographer. And they'll know where to go. So... This was, I mean, we're just driving down the road and these, these two beautiful creatures are just, they're just playing. They're just chasing each other around. I love these guys. And which flash did you use for these? This was 14 and Dynalux. Which flash did you use for these? <laughs> this is no, this is no <laughs> flash. <laughs> yeah, we can light almost anything, but you know. <laughs> you know, I you know, I see now that I think of it, we could have rigged the Land Rover and super <laughs> clamp strobes all over it. Is this with the same 24 millimeter that you like? Yeah, this is, yes. And I pat, I fed them kitty treats right after this. And I, that's why I only have one hand. No. Um, <laughs> no, that was the answer to your question. That's the Tamron 100 to 400. Virtually all this is Tamron 100 to 400. And this was, you know, we got out there and we must have driven about 20 miles to get to the den. And... You know, we didn't sit there very long before the uh, the cubs started to appear. And they were just like kittens. They just were playing. This one doesn't <laughs> quite understand how you get a drink. <laughs> they think it's a straw. Huh? <laughs> they, think they think it's a straw. Yeah. I mean, it, the cat, the cubs playing with, with the lioness's tails was kind of constant. And they climb all over the big cats. And as long as you give them your space. I mean, we were out there for a good while and could have stayed. This was a, we were on our way to, um, <clears throat> um, to um, the uh, Big Cat Rescue Reserve. And I just shot this out of the, you know, the back window of the van. 
And I'm just sitting there and I'm just going, that sun is going to get near a tree or something. <laughs> and that came out of it. This is one of the rescued cats. They had rescued this cat um, from the zoo in Aleppo, during, literally during the bombing. And when they found it, it hadn't, they thought it hadn't been fed in several weeks. And it was pretty emaciated. But this is one pretty happy looking kitty. Once in a while, <laughs> excuse me, once in a while, the flare ends up in the right place. After we had um, <clears throat> cause been teaching at Exposure, you know, if I'm going to go that far and do something, I'm going to hang around and enjoy the area. <clears throat> so uh, we went way out into the desert and went out and photographed camels. That's another one from the camel take. I think it was Jay Maisel had a great story about photographing camels. These people took them out early in the morning for to show him a site that no one else ever gets because it's going the opposite direction. And on the way back, he asked, how come no one goes there? And they told him, what's well, the bombing range? But they never start before 9 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, nobody was shooting at us, you know, because yeah. I'm not a big fan of when they shoot back. <laughs> so this is just an amazing place. This is the Grand Mosque in um, Dubai. Um, I mean, you go and, you know, you have to respect well, but uh, you can just wander around and you can't walk into the middle of a prayer service, but this place is just enormous. <clears throat> and they couldn't have been nicer about letting you photograph there. It was interesting, before I went, um, I had, uh, if you're one of the ex presenters at Exposure, they have you become one of the judges for their contest. So one of the categories is best to the Emirates. So I'd already seen all these pictures from other people. So I knew where to go. <laughs> it's research. Yeah. But isn't this amazing? So, you know, again, blue hour, drag the shutter, let those clouds move. This is um, obviously Tower Bridge and um, National Geographic very nicely used this picture double spread, which I was thrilled because Lord knows there were no other pictures of Tower Bridge. Um, <laughs> anyway, no, no, and I didn't even know about it. Somebody called and told me. So, and you know, you, you do this and, you know, you can kind of see my tripod is over the railing and you know, obviously I'm waiting for blue hour and then I'm waiting for a bus because you want, you know, the buses and the lorries give you these high lights. So you got to figure it out. So I spent a lot of time doing this sort of stuff for fun. Regent Street. This was uh, obviously Moulin Rouge. And this, you know, it's again in, in shooting this and I shot it a bunch of ways, you know, do I want the windmill to be complete? Do I want to be able to see each blade? Or to me, this was sort of the happy medium and just playing around with your shutter speed. This is, I really want to get back on an airplane. <laughs> I haven't been on it. I came back from WPPI last, last March 1st, like one in the morning, I haven't been on a plane since. But this is actually, you know, full moon um, in Boston. My original thought was I'm going to go and I'm going to get the plane, you know, from Logan Airport in front of the moon. Well, yep. the planes at Logan Airport are, you know, when they cross in front of the moon, you don't see the moon because they're so much closer than you. So this plane was going somewhere, but I don't know where. <laughs> this is uh, right, the art center right up the street from the house. Um, again, rainy day, long exposure, cross screen filter. Uh, it gives you this effect. Um, anybody who's ever been to South Beach has photographed the Colony Hotel. I was trying to, thought maybe I'd attempt to do something a little different. So this is about a 13 second exposure. Obviously I'm on a tripod and I start and then I zoom my lens. And when I very slowly, and then I slowly pan the camera all in the same exposure and then start to zoom it back out. Is that clicking coming from you, Rick? I don't think so. Huh. I'm gonna no. mute everyone. 
And then just unmute made. yourself, Rick. Yep. I didn't mute. Now unmute. No, you're muted, Rick. How about there. now? There. Okay. I think that got rid of it. Did my teeth stop chattering? <laughs> cool. Anyway, this is um ironically, this uh, we had finished a long day on a movie set. Um, we'd been shooting at this house. This is um up on the coast north of Boston. And as I I pulled my car up to pack all my gear, and I look up and this is just happening in front of me. Whoops. We're almost done. Uh, I play a play a quite a bit or a some with infrared. So this is on uh, Chicago with an infrared. And my infrared camera is like a really old Nikon D300S. So Vermont in the fall. Uh, the, our bridge in Boston. They spent billions of dollars to build this bridge and then they let them build buildings all around it so you can hardly see it. <laughs> this is, um, I think this is probably the very end of it. Yeah, because this is right up the street from the studio. So, so I did this not too long ago, you know. F-16, I do, I do this a lot, you know. Blue hour, I take my tripod and cable, release one lens and go wander. Oh, oh, the last couple. So these are, uh, every time I do a workshop, we have to do what we call silly group photograph. Um, and the original idea of silly group photograph was I wanted to prove that I actually had a student. <laughs> um, they now were actually part of the curriculum of how do you orchestrate a large picture? How do you light it? How do you control it? And, and then I'm actually- step on your head. Well, that, that's, that, that's my model, Juliana. Yes, yeah, she's trying <laughs> to keep the, the model's trying to keep the photographer in line. Yeah. Yeah, we've done so many projects together. I start to tell her what I want. She goes, yeah, I know. Um, but ironically, when I do these pictures, and this is part of what I'll be teach, what I teach people, is I'm actually taking the photograph. So I have a, a camera set up right here um, on a... Um, uh, enduro tripod, which is what I like using for a tripod. Uh, it's got a pocket wizard on top of it. And for those of you that use pocket wizards, it's a plus three. I have them set on TX and transmit and receive simultaneously. It's a cable coming out of the pocket wizard that goes into the camera port. I fire the pocket wizard in my hand. It now fires the camera. <clears throat> But we got to worry about all these shadows. So we have big strobes set up over here and here. And then now my, the version of the pocket wizards that I have, because I haven't updated them yet, you have to jump channels. So if I'm on channel 10 to start, mm -hmm. the one in my hand is on channel 10. The one that's receiving is actually on channel 11. It retakes the signal in. It fires the shutter. It obviously sends a signal back up through the shoe, which now sends a signal back out through the sand pocket widget and is received by the pocket wizards. The updated version of the pocket wizards, which is now available. Uh, and if you have older plus threes, they can update them. So you will, they've got several features, um, but the new one eliminates having to jump channels. The new one also will go for five miles for those of you that need your pocket wizard to go for five miles. <laughs> nah. This is another silly group photograph. Like the guy holding so we get the, the strobes camera. to fire. And you know, the challenge is how do you get all these people to look happy? Because, you know, for those of you that have tried to put together a group picture, inevitably there's one guy who wants to sit in the front row who's just going to sit there and not have any animation and take up a lot of space. And you say, you know, I think we ought to put you in the back row and put the pretty young lady in the front row. In other words, if you don't want to be part of the fun picture, you can't be in the front row. <laughs> and uh, this will pretty much wrap it up. So this is um, a piece that we did at a, uh, a workshop that I did with ASMP uh, and Pocket Wizard up in Northern Vermont. <clears throat> this is a farmer, pardon me, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a farmer with one of his barns. The floor space of this barn is over an acre. You see all these lit windows? There's a different strobe in every window. <laughs> <clears throat> so what we did, and so we lit him, and it's a pretty good distance from the gentleman to this side of the barn. So those same pocket wizards have repeaters built into them. 
So if you those part the plus trees have a range of about a thousand feet or so. Um, if you need more than that on the older ones, you can set it on repeater, and it you can stack them up as far as you want. So you can send the signal as far as you want. So anyway, that's that was the picture, and um, that is a wrap on my presentation. Great. Thank you all well, thank for letting you. me talk to you. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, people have questions. Anybody has questions? Yeah, I hope I have to. an answer. <laughs> Your everyone's muted, though. So if you have a question, first unmute. And join yeah, in. I do have a question. You, you yeah, have please. a picture of the fella sitting on a porch. It's in silhouette. It's just a, a few slides back. Yes. I could have sworn when I did the research on you before this thing happened, that the picture you just showed us was cropped in more than the one. No, they're actually different frames. Oh, okay. There, because there I really, one, you, you are I, great. There is a, a wider shot of that. I really like the wider shot. It's I just, because... I just couldn't find it quickly. <laughs> oh, okay. But yeah, that, <laughs> it, that it, was, else, you know. It's it's like the the image of the fella is is a lot smaller. So it's like the punctuation to yep. the picture as yep. opposed to the subject. I have, I, just, I tell you, I completely agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. I completely agree. Thank you. I love that picture behind you. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm known as a zootographer. I was I, say, I I'm assuming photo. that's a photograph and not a huge bird. <laughs> that's really cool. I really like that. I have been, I, uh, when this whole pandemic started, I started creating Zoom virtual backgrounds for my friends at the zoo. I was a docent and uh, the staff photographer for the Oakland Zoo in California. I recently moved to Arizona. So I have a lot of pictures. I just this week got a request for parrot and macaw um, Zoom backgrounds. And this is one of them. <laughs> it's great. It's really awesome. Cool. So yeah, you're getting a few thanks in the chats there. I don't know if you have the chat window open. I want to say, uh, are you asking photos? me? Absolutely. Yeah. Who would you like to photograph next? Anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I know after this pandemic thing. Uh, no, I mean, it's, I, I just like the challenge and, you know, each situation presents a unique challenge. So, um, I, I, I don't have the answer. You know, I can think of lots of people I would like to photograph, but I'm very happy. I like the challenge of I get an assignment. When I get an assignment, it's go make a portrait of. And that's it. I mean, that's, you know, we're going all the way back to the Zuckerberg picture. You know, go photograph this kid, Mark Zuckerberg, and go take his picture. <laughs> um, and I have this thing, you know, I want to know as much about every subject as I can before I go. Um, you know, is my goal is if I can ask one vaguely intelligent question, um, you break down the wall. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I, <laughs> prior to the pandemic, I spent a lot of time photographing academics. And I have to admit, some of the folks I've photographed, I can barely understand their bios, let alone what they actually <laughs> do. But Michael. if I if I can go in and say, you know, I, I did one piece where, um, the, the woman studies beyond string theory. Great. My <laughs> physics knowledge is not too good. String and, cheese. But we did some research and I asked her a question and she looked at me and said, well, when did you study physics? I've spent, I said, I've spent the last three days learning everything I can so I can <laughs> ask you this question. And it shows people that you know, you you care enough. Okay, my cat is wrecking things. <laughs> Stop rearranging the studio, cat. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it shows them that you care. We photographed yeah. Anthony Hopkins. Um, I went and I saw some of his earliest movies. So I could ask him what, I mean, everybody was asking about his current movies. I said, what was it like when you first started? Did you sneak into theaters? you know, in disguise. He said, no, I used to go to theaters. I didn't need a disguise. Nobody knew who I was. <laughs> but it was something, you know, to break it down. I mean, obviously with someone like him, he's a pro. And as long as you're getting along with him, you know, because yeah. um, we are invading their time. Yeah, Michael, so do you have a question? We need to be respectful of that. I have a non-photographic question for you. 
Uh oh, now I'm in trouble. I barely can do the photographic ones. <laughs> Man, me too. Uh, is is Blindstrom's still a, a viable place in Boston? No. Oh, really? That goes back a few years. It's gone. Oh yeah. Really? Oh. Yeah, I I don't even can't even remember when. I mean, it's they used to have the largest menu ever from anybody. Yeah. And if you if you can eat two Fresser sandwiches. You got your name put up on, on the wall. It was Blindstrom's, and then there was Jack and Marion's that also did that. Oh, yeah, Jack and Marion's also. Yep, but <laughs> unfortunately, they're gone. They're all gone. Wow. Yeah, they're both gone. Wow. Yeah, we need a good deli. Send one. <laughs> yeah, we need one out here, too. I miss my pastrami sandwiches. <laughs> and corned I beef. actually meant Jack and Marion. Blindstrom's was a, uh, was a, I think, a, uh, a nightclub, wasn't it? I believe I believe it was a nightclub. Yeah, club. yeah. that's right. Yeah. That was kind of. <clears throat> um, anyway, I, I was never there. I went to school <laughs> there. I went to back in the back in the sixties. Where'd you go to school, sir? For one year, Curry College. Oh, okay. But I but it was in Milton, Massachusetts. Still is. But 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 three of us and myself four, we we were bored. And so we decided, unbeknown to our parents, we, we rented a studio, uh, an apartment above the place called Newberry Delicates, Delicatessen on the corner of Commonwealth and Mass Avenue. Oh, high rent district. <laughs> no, it wasn't that high, wasn't high rent then. <laughs> it certainly is today. <laughs> but but the, the, uh, does anybody out there know who the famous um high jump uh, uh athlete was at boston university got me on that one the back I covered a lot of boston. sports but i never covered high jump neither did i but very famous high jump hmm. uh uh athlete that became a superstar i i, I can't help you with that one johnny mathis well. johnny mathis <laughs> absolutely right Oh, did wow. he take up some other career? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think he hums in the he hums in the shower. He hums a bit. Yeah. Okay, but, but he but he went to BU. I did not know that. Yeah, Stephen Gotts has a question there yes, about please. planning any personal projects, or you found a political candidate that you would shoot pro bono. No oh, a political candidate that I no. would shoot to find. Shoot, sorry. Um, <laughs> not um, considering the no, last four I, you years. Know, if I could think, you know, maybe so, if I really like somebody running for something very local. Um, but, um, you know, if everybody else on a campaign is getting paid, I don't see why the photographer should be the one to donate. And, um, you know, there is, I mean, not only can candidates, and I'm trying to think of, if I might have had one or two campaigns ask for something free. One of my favorite ones of somebody asking for something free who, could pay for it was somebody called uh, from Harvard and said that Professor so and so really liked that picture and um, could we send it? And we always say, well, what are you going to use it for? And that becomes a pricing process because look, I mean, we all love doing this. And yes, this is my hobby, but it also is how I pay the mortgage. <laughs> and anyway, this this person's uh, aide said, um, well, we really feel you should donate this picture to Harvard because we're a nonprofit. <laughs> To which point after my assistant picked herself off the floor after laughing so hard, she said to this woman, well, do you get paid? And the woman said, well, of course, this is my job. And that's for us, one of our problems in our line of work is that, and today I've got an iPhone, I could do what you do. Um, and I'm sure anybody in this group can easily do what I do. Do you know but Seth you're not Resnick? Asking me, I'm sorry? Do you know Seth Resnick? I do. What a talent. <laughs> and 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 he, he started a group out of Boston way back when. Way back when. Uh, uh, EP, Editorial Photographers. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And well, I knew him when he lived in Boston. Yeah, but just brilliant, brilliant photographer. Yeah. Seth, Seth and a and heck of a nice friends. guy, too. Yeah. yeah. Seth and I are best friends. Yeah. Should so, we put Keiko on the spot and ask her any story she has about you? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Keiko, behave. <laughs> <laughs> You wouldn't be the first one to do that to her. <laughs> Let's see if she can unmute there. There you Hello. go. 
Hello. Hi, Miss Kanko. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. <laughs> It's nice to see you. We're up the street from each other and we don't see each other. <laughs> we used to see each other Pandemic. like every day. <laughs> we did, but not so much. <laughs> so what's it like really to work with Rick? You know, Let me take my earpiece out before you answer so I don't hear you. <laughs> no, it's, it's really a prompt process working with him because, you know, you guys are photographers and I, I shoot myself too. She so is a brilliant for, photographer, people. Thank you. But working for Rick on assignment, you know, is building block, you know, he gets the, he gets the information who to shoot, where to shoot and what's about. And then we often talk about how can we, you know, make the story visible. Then we build the block. And then, you know, he has to get his head in the game before the shoot. And that's all we do as a photographer, you know, how do we translate the idea to the image and get that personal information then? It's really fun working with him. Yes, I, I, I've been very lucky. We have worked together as a team for, I don't know, 15 years now? Been, been many, many years. Yes. But, I you was know, young when we started. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> you still are. <laughs> yeah. But it's like really built in block. You know, I feel like when I think of my own shoot, so, you know, whenever you do, you, got, you do the own shoot, the little starting point, you know, what lens should I do? Then he he always choose the scene, you know, location where he wants to shoot with his camera. And then, you know, he shoot, looks through the lens. That's something I learned because you think this is great. Then you put the subject there, then you put your lens through it. It looks kind of different sometimes, you know, but all the little tricks that, you know, it's a built-in block. Yeah, it's a lot of creative play things. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you, Keiko. Thank you. Thanks, Anyone else Keiko. has any questions? I, if, must say I was going to say, if somebody, if, if somebody thinks of something afterwards or you have any, any questions, um, please feel free to drop me an email. It's rick at rickfriedman.com. And um, yeah, if you want to, anything you want to ask about, you know. Yeah, Ian, you know, did you have something? Well, I was just a comment. Your, your photos please. are absolutely so tremendous that you've- It's all caught, Keiko's fault. Well, it could be. <laughs> But you've caused me to rethink myself. I'm for now on going to strive to be mediocre, so I don't have to come up to that level and make <laughs> myself. It's doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to strive for that. Yeah. You know, I I kind of think we all feel this this way about you know what can I do to make them better? I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, I'll come back from a shoot and you know that thought goes through your mind of why didn't I? You know, why didn't I think of this while I was there? For me, it's I thought of it before I got there and forgot it while I was there and then remembered it the next day. It's like, oh, I brought that other piece of equipment because I was going to do this and just well, never got around to it. That's, you know, I, it's funny you mentioned the equipment because oh. sometimes it's this this challenge depending on what I'm doing. And I have to admit, um, the older I get, the less stuff I'm carrying. Sure. You know, oh, oh. Um, looking back on the early part of my career, you know, when I started working for Newsweek, I mean, we were expected to shoot color and black and white. Why they couldn't make a conversion was beyond me. You know, so we're out there and you've got one, two cameras with Tri-X in them and two cameras with Ektachrome. And you know, if you miss by more than half a stop, your picture is <laughs> absolutely useless. And, um, you know, today it's, I, on that kind of a shoot, like, you know, Keiko and I both spent a lot of time, you know, covering the various protests. I, I feel like I spent most of last, you know, spring, summer and fall walking around the city of Boston backwards um, and occasionally ducking tear gas. And, yeah. um, you know, but that's if I'm carrying two cameras, two lenses. But on a big shoot, you know, if we can drive, um, the goal is to see how much crap we can put in the back of my Jeep. Because... Yeah. Let me ask uh, uh, actually some serious questions. Couple, uh, uh, what program do you edit in, and how do you catalog, keep track, archive, retrieve the photographs you're looking for? If I turn this computer around, you would be horrified. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it kind of really almost depends on what I'm doing. So if I'm on a news story and I'm on a tight deadline and I've got all these images and I just want to blow through them, 
I'm going to just from the card, I'm going to edit and photo mechanic, pick my handful of select and probably process them in Luminar. And again, if it's a new story, I can't change the shape of the face or the body, but I can quickly turn it around and convert it from a raw to a JPEG. On a story uh, like the one that we did for the Post magazine last weekend, that one I had some time. So I come back and I always shoot everything on two cards. I come back to the studio. I take one card. Um, at that point, I've got a little time. So I'm going to take the whole thing and uh, dump it in Lightroom, where, which becomes my archiving system. So I'm going to keyword it. I'm going to caption it dump it in um, Lightroom Classic, go through the quickly, pick my first select, second selects, and then when I get it down to a manageable number. And, you know, the shoot that we did um, for the mag, post mag, um, at the end of my first edit, I had 120 selects, which is a bit too many. So brought it down, brought it down. And I know this editor, so he's fine. He's like, yeah, you can send me 75 pictures. I don't care. You know, it'll take me two minutes to go through them. Um, and occasionally I've said to this editor, did you see this one? And sometimes I say, oh, I missed it. Um, but at that point, then I have it cataloged. If it's a fast, and fast news shoot, then I will add it in. So the archiving is done um, when, it, when I copy it onto one drive, I actually copy it onto two drives, and then I use Backblaze for offsite storage. I think Michael answer? had you had your hand up. Yes, I, I have two questions. Earlier, you mentioned the fact that you you own 95, 97% of yep. all your images, but do, uh, who, how do you maintain your stock photo library and who does it for you? <laughs> um, it's a very good question. So there's a couple of ways that, that stock works for me. Um, you does know, it still I have always, huh? Does it still work at all? It does still work at all. Yeah. Some of it. Um, so I have this, you know, this enormous number of black metal file cabinets and God only knows how many drives are in this place. You know, and it's funny, you know, I mentioned Doug Hansgate earlier. He's always wailing on me, get one enormous drive and put it all there. But not really, don't really want to go out and spend six grand on a drive at the moment. Um, so, you'll a, but you'll need a scanner also. I have one sitting next to do. me. Yep. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. I'm not scanning those slides. Drives are a lot less expensive than they I, once I, were. I'm pretty yes. sure nobody's going to call me up to buy a picture of Mike Dukakis. Pretty sure of that. <laughs> um, so the end of the other part of the question. So I was with Blackstar for a very long time, which was, a, was just the place to be. It was a great, great photo agency. The Howard Chapnick who owned it treated all of us like we were with his kids, him and his wife. Um, and I was with them for a long time. And then as the business started to change um, I, and assignments, because they would not only handle my archives, they would get me assignments. Um, but as things started to change, anyway, I um, went over to Corbis and was with Corbis right up until the time there was no Corbis. Um, so Corbis was sort of amazing how this happened. Um, the notice comes out, Corbis has been sold to China Visuals. At the same second, China Visuals sends out a release that says all worldwide distribution other than in China will be done through Getty. So great, you're a Getty photographer, whether you want it to be or not. Um, and to their credit, they do sell stock. Uh, they do mail me money every month. Um, some months are better than others, you know. Uh, depending on the pictures and the value of them. Um, but it's not the relationship I had with other agencies in terms of being with an agency that represents me and handles some of my more current work. I'm with an organization called Polaris. So you, so did, were you, did you deal with Roger Russmeyer when he was with uh, Corvus? Well, and I can't say, I, I, I certainly know, I don't know him well, but I certainly know Roger Russmeyer, yeah. Yeah, because he was the first one that uh, 
that uh, Jobs uh, uh, bought his uh, his collection. Right. Yes. Well, they and, didn't and, buy. And that you know, started. I, yeah. Well, some collections were bought and some collections were licensed. So my right. work was licensed. But like I said, I mean, you know, I do. Getty does mail me money every month. And, you know, I have certain pictures, depending on how popular they are. I mean, I and I, I meant to put one of these in and I didn't. Um, but, uh, you know, a number of years ago, I had an assignment. Um, it was a couple of day assignment to go photograph the grape mines of Cambridge. Uh, you know, it was a German magazine. And, you know, do you want to go photograph all these professors and I love photographing professors. I have this illusion that if I hang out with enough really smart people that it will rub <laughs> off. It hasn't yet, but I'm waiting. And uh, so, you know, when I went, I probably photographed a quarter of the people at this gathering and, you know, Marvin Minsky trying to tell Leo Wilson jokes and it was absolutely fantastic. And there's this one guy who keeps popping into all the pictures and I have no idea who he is. I ask a professor and he goes, he's the guy paying the bills. Okay, I mean, you know, so I figured, well, I've never done a portrait session with the guy. I'll set up a portrait session with him while I was there. And um, I'm pretty sure you've all seen these photographs. Um, the guy is Jeffrey Epstein. So all the pictures of Epstein <laughs> with all of the noted academics. And I shot all that. Now, wow. no idea who the guy was. He was a guy who was paying for research, as far as I knew. And uh, obviously, those images sell. You know, a lot better than a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's it's you know, we all know what we're getting for stock, too. You know, it used to be a mid page uh, space rate minimum used to be two hundred and fifty dollars. I'm not sure it's two hundred and fifty cents anymore. Well, I was going to say they moved the decimal point. Mm -hmm. They do. And they places. keep moving it. Pretty soon. <laughs> That's right. Them. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, you know, photographers every so often like to get together and see who has gotten paid the least amount for a picture. <laughs> right. I always like it if it sells for you know 82 and a half cents they keep the half penny <laughs> so I guess if you're getting you get a lot of half pennies <laughs> you make a lot of money on those half pennies yeah that's right you do. <laughs> so yeah I try sending those to the bank it doesn't work <laughs> um, but you know well, I mean there is still stock and I have this thing if, I, if somebody calls me directly um, because either it's not in the archives or there are people who call me. I just had a call the other day from the LA Times, and I, I know they can get this picture somewhere else through one of the agencies, but they wanted to talk to me about the photograph. Uh, and my feeling is if they call me directly and I had a minimum space rate 15 years ago, $250, I'm not selling it to you for $70. And I've had people say to me, well, I can get it somewhere else for 70. And it's like, well, fine. Then I'm not getting up from my chair. I'm going to find it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So... Um, but, you know, I, a lot of stuff people, I would say a lot, but, you know, we, we do a certain number of stock sales directly. Great. You know. Well, we're, we're approaching but do you two have hours people here. doing the work for you? I'm sorry? Do you have, you have workers that are maintaining your stock file and doing those, uh, doing that work for you? Not. Allowing you to negotiate with the, uh, with, with the. There, with there the, is nobody who works in, in the office full time. There's a cat. <laughs> there, yeah, there are two. And their ability to edit is not bad. Uh, they tend to you know, get fixated on one key and like to sit on it. <laughs> so, well, then they're editors. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> OK. So you got rid of all the sandboxers. Yes. So, okay. <laughs> um, but you know, over the years, I have had people work here full time. Um, but you know, I mean, the, you're pay, with an agency, you're paying them to do all that. Yes, you are. So that's you know, and I I have had agents, people from agencies, contacting me, saying, "We got a request for this. Do you have it?" Um, to which I hopefully do, and if not, I hopefully know a friend who does. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of you know keeping it in the family. So, I want to thank you, Rick. This has been great. You my a pleasure. Lot with I was going to say, are there, are there any chats to yes. or have we answered them all? I um, really, I just realized it was a button there that I could see chat. <laughs> so for everybody who said thank you, I greatly appreciate it. Sure. And, if you uh, click those three dots next to it, it'll save the chat for you, so you can go look at it later. Where it says file. Yeah, there's three dots next to it. Oh, cool. Yeah, that'll save that. Save cool. well, chat. Thank you, everyone. 
Yeah, thank you all for your time. I really appreciate yeah. it. Thanks so much for having me. I've got me. Monday scheduled with Peter Hurley. Hopefully that'll work out and we'll get this thing going. Uh, that he should be fun. Some, he always has something to say. <laughs> He's great. He's terrific. Very cool. Yeah. Well, thank so, you all. Uh, hey, if anybody has any questions Thanks, about Rick. the workshops, please feel free to reach out. If, you're, if you know anybody in Florida who's an antique car nut, this one's going to be incredible. <laughs> no. So thanks. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you all, everyone. Yeah. Have a great one. Ciao. Yeah.